Welcome to our advanced hormone testing tutorial. In this video series we're going to take you through a number of topics that will assist your decision making when it comes to uh, testing hormones. In this first video we're going to go through an introduction to our own hormone testing which is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones that we call Dutch and we're going to go through a number of different scenarios and kind of walk you through this testing matrix uh, and discuss the testing of sex hormones and adrenal hormones as well as uh, an array of HRT monitoring scenarios and discuss the pros and cons of serum testing, saliva testing, traditional urine testing, and then our dried urine testing for these different scenarios to assist you in navigating uh, this topic of just understanding what lab tests are most appropriate for a given situation and avoid those situations that can lead to clinically misleading information. So in part one, we're going to discuss just the basics of hormone testing and an overview of the uniqueness and the advantages of the testing model uh, that we use and then go through different scenarios, uh, adrenal hormones, sex hormones, and then uh, various uh, HRT scenarios. And at the end of that series, if you go work your way all the way through it, uh, I think you'll find yourself much more confident in knowing which hormone testing tools to use in different situations. So we're talking about steroid hormones, uh, you know, your basic hormones for the adrenals. We're talking cortisol, DHEA, uh, for the ovarian hormones, which are obviously relevant in not just women, but also in men, uh, you know, your estrogens and progesterone, and then of course, testosterone. So your basic hormones can be available in any of these tests, serum, saliva, or urine. So for the sex hormones, again, estradiol, testosterone, progesterone, and then DHEA or DHEAS, and cortisol for your adrenals. And those really form the foundational basis of any hormone test. And again, those are available in any of the common modalities of testing. But when you want to look at a more comprehensive overview of hormones, we want to add to that picture not just estradiol, but also your estrogen metabolites, and not just testosterone and DHEA, but also your androgen metabolites. So we can look at DHT production and some of these more complete pictures of hormones. We want to look at you know, your daily free cortisol pattern is a really important piece of HPA axis function, but then also we're going to talk about the importance of looking at metabolized cortisol as well. The challenge here is that some of these tests are available in a urine test, and some of them, like the daily free cortisol, is only available or was only available in saliva testing, and so you have to pick and choose when you're looking at different tests as far as which information you want to get and which information you want to give up. And the most comprehensive is urine testing. If you look at a 24-hour urine test, what you're missing uh, mostly is this daily free cortisol pattern, but it's a really important piece of information. The other thing that you're missing from a urine test when it's a traditional 24-hour urine is just an easy patient collection that can help with compliance so that you can actually get the testing done because patients are you know, often reluctant to complete a 24-hour urine test. But if you look at the overall picture, a urine test really is the closest to being a more complete picture. So we start with that picture that, again, is missing the daily free cortisol. And we look at this really interesting study from 2005 and 2006 where they looked at controls and they looked at chronic fatigue patients. And they noticed that in saliva, you get the pattern you expect in your healthy controls, which is an increase in cortisol upon waking, and then it drops down throughout the day. Your chronic fatigue patients show the same pattern, but with lower levels, which makes sense. But when they look at this in urine, so spot urine collections, you can see an almost superimposable pattern. So the levels are going up in the early part of the day, and then back down, and at lower levels for the tr chronic fatigue patients. So if we can collect spot urine samples and get this missing piece of information that's generally not available in a urine test, there's the potential to have a more comprehensive test. Now, to make the collection easier, what we do is we use a dried collection, and when you compare that to a liquid collection, the correlation is very strong, so we're not compromising the accuracy, but we've got a much easier test. So patients are saturating the filter paper on these collection devices 
one, two, three, and four times throughout the day, and the timing is set up to parallel what you normally get in saliva. It's really easy to do. They saturate the filter paper. The label uh, for this device is a sticker, so they simply hang those up to dry for 24 hours and send them back into the lab, and we can test cortisol from those individual samples to give the diurnal or the daily free cortisol pattern, but then we can combine them in such a way that we also get an excellent correlation to a traditional 24-hour urine test such that for the rest of the profile, it becomes a very nice alternative to a 24-hour urine, and you end up with a test that has all of this information in one easy test. You get your basic hormones, but you're also getting the metabolites of all of these various hormones along with the daily free cortisol and melatonin, but you have a very easy patient collection, so it's uh, not difficult for your patient as well. So this dry urine test for comprehensive hormones has really become a nice preferable option for many providers that want a comprehensive look at sex and adrenal hormones and as you juxtapose it with these other tests you can see that there just isn't another way to get all of this information in one nice easy test. So as we go through this video series, we're going to be looking at uh, the adrenal hormone testing and all of these different uh, methods of testing, and then sex hormones and metabolites, and then this very important topic split into different short videos looking at what the best way to test is for different supplementation scenarios. So we're going to be navigating this testing matrix, uh, and if you'll get this uh, as a, an actual file that we can give you, you can click on the different parts of it and look at the short uh, videos that relate to each of these topics so that as you're navigating these decisions uh, in your practice, then we'll know which tools work well for a given situation. So if you want more information on this dried urine test for comprehensive hormones, uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, info at precisionhormones.com, and we'd love to continue this conversation uh, to introduce you to this exciting new test. And as you go through this video series, I think you'll also find, independent of this particular test, that it's a very good way to get educated on when to use serum testing, when to use saliva testing, and a traditional urine test, and when those are, are strong, and when there are some issues there in terms of monitoring hormones. So that concludes this first video, um, but at the end of this, I'm going to go through a couple case studies if you want to hang on to the end of this video to just show some of the utility of this dry urine test for comprehensive hormones. So this test, uh, and just starting with the report, we're looking at uh, progesterone metabolites, androgen metabolites, and estrogen metabolites. It's pretty expansive in terms of uh, these sex hormone metabolites. And then we can, we're going to plot those graphically as well. Uh, and I'll just show you this case study here to show some of the utility. This is a male patient. And you can see with this male patient, he's got relatively low testosterone. So young, healthy men are going to be up in the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s. So his testosterone's dropped down quite a bit. Um, if you look at his DHEAS, it's actually low, but when we look at DHEA, we're looking at the sulfate, but we're also looking at these two downstream metabolites, which are the two most abundant androgenic metabolites, and this is really kind of shows why I like a urine test for sex hormones, because you can see the DHEAS gives you the message that his DHEA is relatively low. Whereas these metabolites show it to be more uh, within the normal range. And when you look really at the overall picture here, if we add in the cortisol piece, we can see that his free cortisol in the morning is supposed to be within these two black lines. It's really elevated in the morning and then on the higher end in the afternoon. So he's making an awful lot of cortisol. So in this particular case, we've likely got a lot of inflammation. Inflammation is going to drive the production of cortisol inflammation also inhibits sulfation. So even if you have adequate levels of DHEA, the DHEA sulfate is going to be a little bit on the low side so that if the only thing you're measuring is the sulfate in saliva, in blood, it can be a little bit misleading. We want to look at the overall picture to really see what's going on. What else does inflammation drive? It makes prostaglandins. Prostaglandins really drive aromatase, and aromatase turns androgens into estrogens. And look at this gentleman's estrogens. 
Very, very high. So overall, this guy really has a picture of inflammation. Decent DHEA, but low sulfate. Uh, and then high levels of estrogens, high levels of cortisol. So we can see this in a little bit more detail. We can look at more detail in the estrogens and see that you would expect if these estrogens are high, you would also expect that the downstream metabolites of the estrogens would likewise be high, and it's not for this 2-hydroxy estrogen. And that's really the preferred pathway of getting rid of your estrogens is the 2-hydroxylation. That's a protective pathway, and it's relatively low. Whereas the, the uh, toxic 4-hydroxy E1, which creates a lot of DNA damage, is actually elevated. So this is a patient who not only has a lot of estrogens, he's not clearing it very effectively. So th this is situations where a, pa a doctor might look at that and give a patient methane or indole-3-carbonyl or simply try to increase his uh, intake of cruciferous vegetables because we know that those compounds increase this good uh, hydroxylation pathway, this phase one metabolism, and that's going to increase those levels. It's also going to decrease these elevated uh, primary estrogens, and so he's going to have a little bit less estrogen dominance going there. Now, th there may be some steps also to block aromatization, uh, to reduce the inflammation, which may be driving this, uh, but it really gives you an overall look at uh, these hormones in, in an effective way to really get a broader picture of what's going on. This particular patient also shows very low methylation activity. So that's where we're turning these hydroxy estrogens into methoxy estrogens. And there are genetic defects uh, that can be tested. Uh, and when those exist, often we see this poor methylation picture. So again, we can see that from the profile, which has uh, effects on neurotransmitters and, and other areas. Uh, so again, we're just getting more information as to what's going on with the patient. Certainly, if it was a female, we'd also be looking in at the progesterone levels to see what's going on there. Um, we can see this one particular androgen metabolite is elevated. And that's interesting in that that's in the pathway with DHT, which is a very potent androgen that also has some role in prostate cancer risk. So in prostate cancer risk, if you have a lot of DHT being made and you have a lot of estrogen and you have a lot of 4-hydroxy estrogens, those are all risk factors to a certain degree for a, a bad situation in terms of just managing prostate cancer risk. So if for a patient like this, where we've got the inflammation driving a lot of this hormone metabolism, we really want to address that and monitor what's going on, but it's, it affects him in, in so many different areas that that's a really nice use for this test is you can really see the effects of what's going on in multiple areas. Uh, so that really becomes quite useful. So we can see with this gentleman is cortisol is really high. And what we'll show in the next video with the adrenals is that a lot of times when you see this free cortisol pattern, we're looking for you know, the question of, you know, are adrenals putting out enough cortisol? And so when we look at the free cortisol pattern, if you look at this patient, you can see they're quite low. Right? So the black represents the reference range or expected levels, and they're very low. And so the, the conclusion when people are testing this is, oh, your adrenals are not making enough or adequate cortisol. And what we're going to show in that video is if you move on to the second video – is that that's not always the case. And you really need to be looking at a more comprehensive overview of the adrenal hormones because you can be really fooled with what's going on when you're only looking at the free cortisol picture without the levels of cortisol metabolites or metabolized cortisol. And so if you'll look at this next video of adrenal hormone testing, you'll really see some usefulness and what really drove the development of this test of needing a more comprehensive look at those adrenal hormones to make better clinical decisions. So I hope you found this useful and I hope that if you have some information, you'll reach out to us on this Dutch testing and we're excited to introduce it to you and hopefully you can continue through this series of videos. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at info at precisionhormones.com and we look forward to working with you.